Amen. Amen. And good evening, everyone. Let me just set up myself here. Good evening, folks. Good evening, Pastor. Good evening. Yes. God's blessings to all. Pastor. God's blessings to all. Trust you had a good weekend. Uh, wonderful Sabbath rest experience and also a good day today. It's, it's terribly hot these days. Terribly, terribly hot. Thank God for his cooling grace. Well, we are together again tonight Amen. to continue in this wonderful journey through this exciting book, the book of Hebrews. You go along reading the verses and gathering the uh, out of the thoughts of the writer. Not necessary, not necessary, um, Pastor. Yes, um, I um, I um, I was reflecting on our last meeting. Uh, my colleague, I haven't, I'm not seeing him on tonight. Pastor Roy and I, after the meeting, we had some chat and you know some laughter. We really had a um, a real laugh Friday night after the meeting, and um, I told him. And I say to you, you know, I found the meeting was very engaging, you know, thoughts, sharing and discussions. And um, I know Pastor um, Ricky set this thing up for, her, for us to have a question and answers after, because some people may, after any Bible study, um, you want you want dialogue, you want people to, there may be what, what I would describe as cobwebs, okay? Not in a negative way, in people's minds to get things cleared up. So that's the intent of it. You know, so it was, um, somebody said it was, uh, the meeting was, was uh, um, it was heated in terms of the atmosphere. All right? I, I trust some of you would agree, brethren. It was the most engaging meeting we had so far. And in a Bible study, you will have that. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding the um the engagement, I thought I should come on to say tonight. I I um I think it is important that we don't get so engaged in our discussion that we lose focus on what, what this thing is about. Okay. And um I take I take responsibility for um, maybe where the, the um, question and answering went. I took full responsibility for it because I'm the, the presenter. And I also want to make it clear, I know we are on air, that I am not in, interested or intending to get in a debate with anyone on any Bible topic, okay? The Bible is not for debate. It's for discussion, for sharing what I would call, as I tell people, the most I would do it with a Bible text is to say what I understand. This is what I understand from it. And I want to keep it like that. So I want to set up tone tonight and, and state that I would not be getting in, involved in any debates with anyone. Okay? And I, 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 I would not be responding to any statements in the chat. Okay? I am going to make a presentation. And if there are questions and coming based on what was presented, then I would I would engage in that. And if something is not connected to what I discuss, I will not respond to it. I don't think I don't want to use up the time for what I was asked to be here for to engage in other things. Because I think that would be defeating the purpose of the whole of the whole in, intent. Um, there are saints um, listening, maybe online, there are people who are in this chat who have logged in for the sole intent of going through the book um, to see what we can gather from it and ask God to en enlighten our minds and also empower our hearts to live in accordance with his will. And I think if we, if we chart that course, we will benefit from the 
from the um, from the entire exercise. Uh, we will always have differences of understanding, which would lead to differences of opinion. But I don't think we are we are we anybody benefit by engaging in in heated debate of um, of scripture. I, I don't think that's that's beneficial. Amen, brethren. Can I get a response for you? Amen. 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 Yes, amen. Yeah. Amen. Now let's 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 see what the text says. Let's see what the author intends um, to communicate to the reader, and what we can gather from it. Um, my reading of the the chapter that we are continuing in, I f I found it very interesting, and um, Doctor Ocho, I my my position is. I could only share with you um, the, the, the experience of the meal that God served me from his word. I think that's, that's how I could explain. And I would trust that when you get into the word too, you will, you will have an experience eating that spiritual bread and, and feasting on it. You know? So every presenter, every pastor, every preacher, will share with you what God shared with them. And um, they would hope that you enjoy and you are blessed with the reading as God would have blessed, blessed them. Okay, so tonight we're getting, we're continuing in chapter five. I thought it necessary to, to um, go over some verses because for some reason I was, I noticed that there's, there are two verses and they actually were the, what I would probably call call two key verses, even though I read verses that that cl give clear clarity to the point that the, the writer was actually telling the people, um, you're slow, you know, and I want to teach you stuff, but I'm worried if you will understand. Like Jesus told the disciples, I have much to tell you, but you can't hear it. Um, when the Spirit comes, he'll teach you. He will reveal stuff to you. Okay, and that's where the author is in the text. Eh? That's that's what I'm saying. We are looking at the flow of the text. And we need to understand something about the Bible, people. The Bible is a literary document. That is, somebody is writing, and they're writing an, um, an epistle is a letter. And they're explaining stuff. You know, Paul is writing to Corinthians and explaining to them about the schisms in the church, about people who... Um, struggling with who have the greatest gift and all of that. And it, it's, there are real life issues that the author is writing about and explaining stuff. is not uh, Inspiration is not um, somebody just getting flashes in the head, like, you know, um, like, um, like movie flashes, you know, and they're writing, you know. That's not, the, 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 the writer is sitting, the book of Israel, the writer is sitting, Pastor Ricky, thinking clearly and guided by his spirit and writing about points he wants to make and sharing with them and sharing with the, with the brethren. That's what it is. So if, if the writer is sitting and writing like a book point by point on statements he wants to clear up with them, this is how we're reading the book. You know, it's not, we're not looking for pull a verse here and pull a verse there and pull a verse there because there's a theological statement in it that supports something that we believe. No, you read the book, read the flow. And we were following the flow of the book. And we would eventually get to where, the, you know, all that the writer is saying in the book. Okay? And that's what we're doing. As I said, um, sometimes you just sit and read. You know, don't want to study. Read. And in reading, you will get some heavy study by the Spirit. Let's pray and we continue. Father, as we get into the word tonight, we pray your blessing upon us. Uh, help us to, to be receptive of the beauty of your, of your word to us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we go back on uh, from chapter 5. We're in chapter 5 into 6. Let me share a screen with you. Uh, and this portion of the of the text is, is very nice. Yeah. Bible is a, is a beautiful book. Um, I have to share um, sharing screen, so I have to set things in order. That's my. All right, so we're going to recap. 
We're going to recap. And the author, the author is making a statement. We're starting back from verse 9. It's 9 to 14 in chapter 5. The author is saying, the author is saying, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Okay? Unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And you see that statement? As I said, the author is, is, is trying to go somewhere and he's dropping these hints as we're going along. Okay, so we're reading. This is what he said. After the order of Melchizedek in verse 10. And then he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. We, we were there and we have to reconnect here because there's a point. For when, for the time, you ought to be teachers. This is what I missed. I, I don't know how I missed this text. Listen to what Paul is saying. Paul, the author, yes. When you ought to be teachers, Ella Ocho, you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. The, 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 the writer is saying, I am writing to you and you all should be teaching people this. So I have to come and explain to you stuff that you should know. Anybody online tonight? I am explaining to you, he's saying, because you see he's writing the general audience of the book of Hebrews are the, are the Hebrew or Jewish Christians. So he's writing to them to, to explain to them things about Jesus. And he's actually saying, since you all are the Hebrews, you all are the Jews who, are the script, who have the scriptures and expose to the prophecies, you all should have this down. You, you should be teaching the Gentile Christians these things. Church, are you with me tonight? Uh, are you there? Amen. Amen. Okay, I just want to know if I, 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 I'm connected. He is saying, look at verse 12. When for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you. The first principles of the oracles of God. So what, what he's saying, I'm teaching you like if you are, you are new converts, when you are Jews, when you, you, you go to synagogue, you have the oracles, you have everything, you have everything. You, you, you are Christians and you have the Old Testament and you have it long before everybody else. You all should be teaching this thing. Um, but I have to come and explain it to you. That's why he called them dull. And the next verse says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe. I'm, re I'm reconnecting because we're going somewhere. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He says, when, you, when, you have a, when, you, when you're deep in the word, you're able to eat meat. And you, you know the deep things of God. And you could, you could analyze stuff. Not only in scripture, but in righteousness, in good and evil. But you all haven't followed through. So I have to come and set you in order again. That's what the writer is saying. Okay? The paraphrasing. Now he goes, strong meat belongs to them that are full age. And then he says, therefore, in, in the light of this, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let's move on. Let's move on. Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and dead works and faith towards God or doctrine of baptism. He says, I don't need to explain this to you all because you all have the scriptures and you all are Hebrew Christians. And this will we do if God permit. He said, okay, I'll, I, will, I will take you on another level, push you a little further. If the Spirit impressed me to push you a little further, but right now, I know you are struggling to understand simple stuff. Okay? And he said, it is impossible for those who were enlightened. You all are enlightened. And it's impossible if you don't move on, if you fall away, to bring you back. 
That's what he's saying. Is 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 how how possible it is for us, for God to bring you back when you you exposed to all of this. That's what we talked about last last time we met. That the author is actually telling them, I want to explain some stuff to you that very important that you must know for your salvation. But you are you, you, you my my view of you is that you seem not to be ready. But I have to ask God if I should teach you this. And then he explained about the earth, the, the, the trees, how they bear, and those who don't um, bring forth fruit according to God, they are destroyed. So he's, he's looking at the people who, who don't follow God, who don't follow through, how they fall away and they're going to be judged and destroyed. And those who follow through and grow, they are the one who bear fruit. So he's explaining to them, listen, you either going to be thorns or you're going to be fruit. You know, you have to decide if you want to move through. And then he explains in verse 9, but beloved, we, we persuaded better things of you that we believe you will go through. So he gives like a benediction. And then he says, God is not unrighteous. Now we connect. Now we connect. God is not unrighteous to forget your work. This is where we continue in tonight. This is where we connect in from last time. So he actually told them, listen, I expect that you should have known more. You don't know what you're supposed to know. This thing I'm teaching you about Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. I, I'm carrying you somewhere, but it doesn't seem like you, you could go the full mile, but I'm praying you could go. I am praying that you, your mind ready for this thing that I, I want to reveal. Because stay with the writer. Up to where we are, the writer explained better than angels, better than better than Moses, better than Aaron. He wants to go somewhere, but he's setting down the 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 the, the, uh, the pillars, and he's saying, "I don't know if you you able to go to the next stage." That is where he's taking them. He said, "God is not unrighteous to forget your good works." He said, "You have been you have been doing certain things that demonstrate that you are following Christ." Okay, your labor of love show by his name in that you have ministered to the saints. He said, I am seeing things in you that demonstrate that you're following Christ. And I desire every one of you do the same to the full assurance of the hope that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. What the author is, is changing tones now. He says, you are walking on the road. We are, I'm seeing evidence that you are growing in Christ, but you should have grown more. You should have been more enlightened. Uh, 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 God is not ignorant of what you're doing. And um, God has promises for you that he wants to give you. But you have to continue to grow and you will receive the promises. So although the, the writer is aware of the brethren's slowness in their theological growth, in the understanding of Christ, he still commends them for their Christian kindness. He, he commends them and he encourages them and tells all of you, continue on that road. And then he sets the stage to introduce to them something he wants to, to connect to, to where he wants to go. That's how the book is flowing. He's flowing and the thought he's going to weave now, is going to take the audience where he wants to take them. He's going to introduce a character in this part of his, of his dialogue that will set the tone for where he wants to go. Then he says, this is what he talks about. He talks about inheriting promises. Be not slothful, followers of them who through faith and patience inherit. He said, look at the people in, this, in the Bible Look at the scriptures and look at people who followed through and inherit the promises for, from God. That's what, what the writer is saying. And then he, he gives an example. He says, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, surely, blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had 
patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So what the, what the, what the author did now, he introduced the, the, the concept of receiving a promise. He said, if you all continue on the course, you'll receive the promise that God has for you. Like Abraham received the promise after he waited. So th this, this, this piece of, this piece of literature is, is, is so, brethren, uh, 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 forgive me, but I am reading this thing. I said, I'm not, I, I didn't take off to study. I'm reading and I'm looking at the skill of the writer. Jesus is greater than the angels. Look, look at the Psalms. Jesus is greater than Moses. Look what he did. Jesus is greater than Aaron. But he's after the order of Melchizedek. But, but the author wants to explain this to them. But the author said, I, I, I'm not sure if you all can handle this. So he's, he's setting it up to explain this thing. And he switches to the concept of, if you are faithful, you will get the promises God has for you. Watch how God was faithful to Abraham, even though Abraham endured long. So he introduces Abraham as the character who received the promise of a son, Isaac, after patiently waiting for the promise. So he's saying, if you all continue, you all receive the promise that God has for you. For men verily swear by the greater. If you are going to swear, you swear by someone greater than you. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, the immu immutability of his counsel, confirm it by an oath. He said, when you make an oath, you, owe by, you make an oath by someone greater. But when God was making an oath to Abraham, is nobody greater than God. So he said, he said, by two immu immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we, we, he shifted from Abraham, Abraham received the promise. Abraham was told. And Abraham was faithful. He received the promise. He said, well, God cannot lie. God has made promise to you. We might have a strong consolation who have, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. He said, listen, there are, there are promises God has laid down for you. You need to hold on to these promises. Be patient like Abraham was patient. Hold on to the promises. Stay on course. And every promise that God promised to you, he will fulfill it in due time as he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Stay the Amen. course. Stay the course. That's what he's saying. Everything God promised to you, everything, you will get it. So the author is, is changing tones now. He's saying, listen, uh, um, I know you're slow. I know you don't understand. But you're walking. Stay on course. God has promises for you and he'll fulfill them. God cannot lie and God cannot change. Whatever he says will come to pass. You have a hope and that hope will be realized if you stay on course and hold on to your hope. Hold on to your hope. And then he changes again and he changes it too. And this writer is skillful. Then he says, which hope? We have as an anchor bo both sure and steadfast. He said, the hope we have as an anchor to the soul, and that hope is hooked inside the veil in the sanctuary where the forerunner is entered for us, even Jesus. So the writer. He moves from, from, I know you're slow. I know you don't understand some things you should understand. You're walking all right. I want to commend you. I want you to continue walking because God has promises for you. And these promises, he will fulfill as he fulfilled to Abraham. And that, those promises are hooked 
There are hopes that you're hoping for, but those hopes, those hopes are hooked on Jesus. Those hopes are inside the veil. He is talking in the concept of the sanctuary now, like, like the Day of Atonement, when the people outside praying on the Day of Atonement and the high priest is inside the most holy place interceding for them. So he's actually saying, get your mind into the Day of Atonement. Get your mind into the high priest inside the sanctuary. Ministering for you. Get your mind in that. How the, 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 the high priest would have been in the sanctuary, Israel outside of the sanctuary, and they are praying based on what the high priest is doing for them inside the sanctuary. Come on, church. Come on. So their hope is anchored in the high priest in the sanctuary working for them. So he's saying your hope must be hooked on Jesus who is working for you in the sanctuary in heaven. Amen. 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 My King Amen. God. He said your hope, your faith is like a, like an anchor, like a, you know, you drop anchor. How an anchor is dropped and hooked so the ship can't move. Do a storm come? So he said, you must anchor in Jesus. And he is inside of the veil. He is there working for you inside the veil. And you have to hook onto Jesus. But the author knows something has to be cleared up in the mind of the reader. And then he makes the connection when he says, the, 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 the person that you hoping for the forerunner, the one who gone in, entered into the veil of a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He brings back again this Melchizedek. Because, brethren, the Come order on wants to explain to them how Jesus is the high priest. He wants to explain how Jesus became the high priest from a Hebrew concept when there is something fundamental that doesn't add up. That's, the, that's the, 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 what the author is saying. I'm, I want to explain something to you, but this thing tough as a Hebrew for you to understand this. You have to have a mind that is grown up to understand, but you're slow and are struggling to explain this to you. And then he explains something. Three times in the dialogue, three times in the dialogue, he makes reference to Jesus' high priestly role as Melchizedek. But he never explains. Three times. Watch this. High priest. High priest. Hebrews 6, 12. That ye be not slothful, or rather, three times he makes promises. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Point number one. Point number two. For God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So he's talking to them about their benefits. Number three, Hebrews 6.19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. So he said, listen, he said, listen, don't, don't give up, stay on course. Number two, God made a promise, he'll fulfill it. Number three, that promise hooked on Jesus, your high priest. He's in heaven for you. He's taking them somewhere. Amen. And then he says Amen. in the next verse, we're going somewhere, this thing is amazing. He says in the next verse, he says in the next verse, he said in the next verse, that Jesus the forerunner, Jesus the forerunner, is entered even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now he's setting the stage to explain to them this order of Melchizedek. This is where he wants them to go. This is what he wants to talk about. 
how could Jesus be a high priest in heaven after the order of Melchizedek? Because they are Hebrew Christians. And for Jesus to be high priest, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. For a Hebrew, that does not make sense. He's greater than angels. He's setting down the tone. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. He's our high priest. This is literature and theology. He wants to explain theology to them, but he has to explain it in a way that they can understand. So we set the stage. And then in, in chapter, chapter number seven, we came through six. Chapter number seven, which actually is a follow through. We're not looking at um, chapters and numbers. We'll get, we'll get confused. Okay. He says in the next chapter, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being interpreted interpretation by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of salem which is king of peace without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of god abided a priest continually church the author wants to explain to the people how Jesus can become high priest. And it cannot add up how Jesus can be high priest. So he has to explain how could Jesus be functioning in the heavenly sanctuary for us because there are certain realities about the high priest. Ah, boy. Don't rush to the destination without enjoying the stops Amen. along Let's the way. Amen. The author wants to explain this thing about Jesus being our high priest. And this is the part of the book. That he has to, he's trying to explain it. And he's saying, I have some stuff to explain, but you all are slow. But I have to teach you all this because your salvation is hooked on this. Watch, watch this, people. He said, Melchizedek is a priest and a king. Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes. Uh, we're stopping at this verse and we're continuing with chapter 7 later. Okay? This is, this is, this is the anchor down here. Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes. Your father, the great Abraham, gave Melchizedek tithes. He is king and priest. He is king of righteousness and king of peace. He's a type of Christ. He said he doesn't have father. What does that mean? There is nowhere, no in genealogy of, of Melchizedek in the Bible. Abraham, in a sense, he knows Melchizedek is king and he knows he is, he is priest. But, but Moses doesn't say, who is his father? We know who is Abraham. We know, we know. Adam and Eve, and, and after Adam and Eve is, 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 is Cain, Abel, is Seth, coming all the way down to Abraham, to Noah, and then Abraham, all the way down. The Jews can trace genealogy of everybody important in the scripture. But there's a man, pop up, very important, and Abraham gives him tithes. 
He's a king and he's a priest. But there's no genealogy of him. We don't know who is his father. We don't know who is his mother. We don't know who is his children are. We don't know where he came from. And we have no record that he died. So his priesthood abides forever. That is what he's actually saying. Since you have no record of where he came from, no record of where he went, and he was a priest, you could not say his priesthood end because you don't know where he's going. Church, are you are you following this thing? He said Melchizedek is a mystery. Amen. And he said Jesus' priesthood is after that order. It's a mysterious priesthood. Because it doesn't fit in with the Hebrew understanding. Because how could Jesus be priest? And we will see what's going on here. He introduces Melchizedek three times before he explains. Hebrew 5, 6. And he said also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The, the order drops it and moves on. Then he comes back in verse 10, called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he doesn't explain. Then he comes to 620, whether the forerunner is for what? For us, entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The order calls Melchizedek's name three times in this book. Introduced the name Melchizedek three times and doesn't explain it. Three times. And it is when you read chapter 7 and verse 1, then he says, he's explaining Melchizedek now how Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, now he's explaining, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham, returning from slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that, king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. So what the author is saying, God put Melchizedek in the Old Testament to interact with Abraham so that you could understand Jesus' priesthood. That is why Melchizedek is, comes in Scripture. That is why Melchizedek interacts with Abraham. Because later on in history, the high priest of our salvation, there are issues that are going to be raised that cannot be explained, cannot be understood rather, for the, for the Hebrew mind. And, and this writer has to explain it to them. Three times, the author says, Jesus is our high priest in heaven after the order of Melchizedek. And in verse 1 of chapter 7, the author begins to break it down and explain. Let me explain to you all what I mean by Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why? We need to consider some important points here in this Bible study. We need to consider some very, very important points. Why the writer is taking this stone. Point one. Point number one, brethren. Are we all are we all in the meeting tonight? Are we all here? Point number one. Amen. Go on, go on. From a theological point of view. Theological, that is. The author must explain to the reader who is a Hebrew, a Jewish believer, how Jesus can be our high priest. When Jesus' ancestry line is not connected to the tribe of Levi. God appointed the priesthood to the Levites. Aaron is the high priest. And the Levites are the ones who are the priests 
in the nation. So, if the Levites are the priests, Jesus did not descend from the tribe of Levi. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Ah, uh, brethren, this is so nice. Jesus on, came from the tribe of Judah. From a human perspective, his, his ancestry line is connected to Judah. How could Jesus be priest when the Hebrews understand that the priesthood is Levitical? So the writer has to explain from chapter one, he's making all the statements. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Abraham. His um, Aaron, his high priest role is higher than, than uh, more significant than Aaron. And the, the writer, how could he be high priest when he's not Levitical? And the writer is saying, hello, hello. He's not after the Levitical priesthood. His priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. In order for the Hebrew writer, the Hebrew reader, to see Jesus as high priest, the writer has to make it clear that God's system for Jesus to be high priest is not connected to Levi. He's connected to Melchizedek. He's after the order of Melchizedek. No beginning, no ending, no father, no mother. He is eternal. That is Melchizedek represents a priesthood that that it, it is it is mysterious and it is eternal, continual, because you don't know when he was born, you don't know when he died, you don't have any record, he just appears. And the man said, Jesus priesthood is after disorder not Levitical, and he is 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 literary skill he has to use and theological understanding in order to explain to the to the brethren how Jesus can become high priest. And from chapter seven, he goes to explain, this is where we go next, to explain how it is Jesus is 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 Melchizedek order and not Levi. Jesus is functioning after the Melchizedek order. And the Melchizedek order precedes the Levitical order because Melchizedek was there before everybody. And he actually says later on, all Israel gave tithes to, to Melchizedek because they were all in Abraham's loins so that everybody, in a sense, what he's actually saying, if, if Melchizedek is the priest to Abraham, all of Israel, all of Israel must see Melchizedek as their priest. And Melchizedek represents Jesus. Hello, 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 brethren. All of Israel must recognize Melchizedek as priest because your father re recognized him as priest king. And he represented Jesus. Point number one, he must explain it to the Hebrews why, how Jesus can be high priest. Because Jesus is not of the tribe of Levi. That's why he's saying earlier on, I want to tell you something, but you're dull and um, this thing is deep. I want to tell you about Melchizedek, but this is deep and you have to grow up to, to, to digest it because it is out of, your, out of your, your, your normal thinking. How could you see Jesus as high priest when he didn't come from Levi? You say you have to be grown up to understand this. Point number one, he explains it because the Hebrews' understanding of the priest is Levitical. When Jesus is from Judah. Are you with me, brethren? You got that? You got that? Amen. 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 It, is, it, is, it is to explain it to the Hebrews. Amen. That's the first point. Second point. The second point, brethren, when we look, when we look at the fact, that was that's a historical application. He had to explain it to the Hebrews because the Hebrew, nobody outside of Levi could be priest. 
So he said, Jesus is priest after the Melchizedek order. That's the historical perspective. But there is a practical perspective. There is a devotional perspective. And that is where it meets, it, it, the rubber meets the root for us. And the second point we gather from this is, when we look at the fact that the author, Ella Ocho, what's the author? He hints in chapter 5, Jesus is after the Melchizedek order. And he doesn't explain it. He said they're not ready. He goes in verse 10 of chapter 5. He's called after the Melchizedek order. He doesn't explain. He just puts in Melchizedek in their subconscious mind. He's, he's hinting the name, but he doesn't explain. Then he comes again. The forerunner is entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the Melchizedek order. And it's the third time he mentioned it, he begins to explain. This Melchizedek appeared to Abraham and Abraham. He said, he said, I, I think, I think now I can I could proceed. I could proceed now. When he shifted, when he talked about, he talked about your, your promises, your hope. Look how God fulfilled it to Abraham. Then he when he mentioned Abraham, he said, Okay, remember when Abraham met Melchizedek? And Melchizedek, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. And he, he is, is as if his mind is given, he is given a, a flash from God, some kind of inspiration from God. Explain it to them with Abraham. Explain it with Abraham. Show how Abraham uh, had to give regard to Melchizedek. And when the author gets in that zone and begins to explain, watch how Abraham had regard to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek appeared and all of that. Now he's explaining to them who Melchizedek is. So this is how Jesus could be high priest. The author is using, he's using, we call it tact, divine, divine inspiration to explain this to people who cannot understand it. He knows they can't understand it. He knows they will not accept it. They could understand Jesus is Messiah. Okay, they're following Jesus. But they don't really, they can't really deal yet. They don't understand yet. Why is this being written? Because they don't understand yet how Jesus is the high priest. So he's explaining it to them. This is why he's our high priest. When you look at scripture, Melchizedek, look at Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. Melchizedek's name is King of Salem, King of Peace, King of Righteousness. God had him there as a type. Let me explain this to you so you could understand how Jesus could be a high priest. You know what Pastor Manzano learned from that, brethren? When you look at the length the author is going through, he hints Jesus is high priest after Melchizedek three times before he explains in detail. And you could see how God gifted this person gifted this person to, to, to meticulously take time to set this thing down so the reader could he's pacing the reader he's pacing the reader hint by hint gifted this 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 writer this this teacher gifted the teacher to, to take these people step by step to where he wants to take them. Elder Ocho, you are a teacher, step by step. The, the author is not rushing them because he knows they're not ready. So he's taking them step by step, little by little, to where he wants them to go. Because he knows they're not ready. They're slow. And you know what it tells me, brethren? It tells me that God has to gift people Gift them with the with the spiritual gift of 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 sitting and thinking how to patiently, passionately communicate the truth of Jesus to people who are ignorant certain things in Scripture. God is telling me from this. God is telling us from this. Pastor 
teacher, member, Adventist leader. When you meet somebody who ignorant, who don't know, who don't understand like you, look what the writer is telling me. Three times he hints. After Melchizedek order, but he doesn't say anymore. After Melchizedek order, he doesn't say anymore. After Melchizedek order, he say, okay, three times I'll move on now and I'll explain it. Look how much patience the author is, is using all these, all these examples, all these examples of, of, you know, talk about hope, talk about faith, talk about promises, talk about Abraham, all of that to get the, 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 re the reader to where he wants them to go to explain how Jesus can be high priest. Patience. Act. Saying to me as a teacher, everybody may not understand the thing like you. Patience, Adventist. Everybody may not understand the Sabbath truth like you. Everybody may not understand diet like you. Everybody may not understand state of the dead like you. So what do you do? You sit and you patiently walk with them step by step. Give them a little now, give them a little bit, and gradually lead them so they could understand. Yeah. Amen. Don't don't be hurry. I'll, I'll keep it in this. Don't be too hurry to get to the destination that you miss all these things. This is the writer. What's the writer? Skill. Good method. Skill. Skill. To get the reader to where he want them to go. Remember, that's why I went back to, to chapter to chapter five, chapter six, to show the writer is saying, You ought to be teachers. You ought to be teachers, but you're still drinking milk. You ought to be teachers. You ought to be eating heavy food. You should be sharing this, but you don't understand. So I'm, I want you to understand who Jesus is. And he mentioned Melchizedek three times. And now he's taking them gradually to where he wants them to go. Patience. He's sitting there with a pen and he's asking God for the wisdom. Remember the text? He said, I want to teach you. But I have to ask God if God will. And then he's writing and he's he said, okay, I'll continue here now. I'll continue here. What he's telling me, uh, sometimes you have to stay longer than you, you plan to. Sometimes you have to break it down, you know, like Jesus teaching, you know, the kingdom of, 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 um, of heaven is like a man, uh, so in seed, you know, step by step, they're slow. They're slow. They're dull. So, so be patient. Kingdom of heaven is like a woman do in in in, in flower kingdom. Um, east and do rather a uh, uh, kingdom of heaven like a man throwing a net and you know all of that. He meet Nicodemus by the by the um he meet Nicodemus by night or Nicodemus met him by night and Nicodemus just talking to him and Jesus telling him about the kingdom and he starts to talk him about wind and you know the, the spirit like wind and all of that. Jesus meets you where you are and he he gradually takes you to where he wants you to go. He met the woman by the well and he wants to teach her about stuff and he's talking water. You know, drink and all of that. You know, God, God is very patient with us when we slow. That's why I learned from this. Not because you know it, and you know it for long. You have to push it down the throat. Take your time and explain it, and use use you know use methods they could appreciate and understand. Three times the man mentioned Melchizedek. And it's only now he's explaining. Is this getting home to somebody? Three times. Don't expect Amen. them to get Amen. it. Don't expect them to get it at the first shot. Don't expect them sometimes the second shot. You know? And these are Christians he's talking to. He said, you all should be teachers. But right now, you all need milk. You all need milk. I said, uh, uh, um, yeah, you need milk. So he's patient with them. And the point, the third point, first point, the author must explain why Jesus is after Melchizedek order. 
because Jesus is of Judah, not Levi. Not Levi. And the Hebrews understand the priesthood is Levitical. How could Jesus be high priest? He has to, he must explain that to them. That's what this whole section of the book is about. He's explaining to the Hebrews how Jesus could be high priest. Second point. The author is patient. He's taking his time to explain to them. He started with the greater than angels, greater than uh, Moses, greater than Aaron. You know, uh, he has a he has a uh, more excellent um, priesthood, and he's got is there. He's he's carrying them gradually. That's for us. How do we how do we relate to that when we deal with people? who need to be taught slowly. And the last point, uh, leave with us. If I turn back to pastor, the last point, as teachers, we should take a note from the author, how he is pacing by teaching. But as learners, uh, we, there, are, there are two sides of a coin. Pastor Ocho, Dr. Ocho, as learners, you know, there's a word for the teacher. Look at the look at the the, the writer. Oh, he's gradually taking them step by step. As teachers, we should take a hint. But uh, as a reader, let's look at the reader. The reader, the listener, the one who is being taught. Those of us who are being taught. And all of us are learners. When we sit and we are being taught, like the readers of Hebrew, the readers of the right of, of that book, seeing how the writer is 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 um is is explaining this breaking it down for us. As readers and as those who are being taught, we should be thankful to God. For God, for being so patient with us, to teach us, and thankful to God for people who He chose to sit and patiently teach us. See, see we we there are some of us we have we, we have no regard for our teachers. We have no respect. We, we don't have respect for pastors. We don't have respect for teachers. We don't have respect for the, the elders. We, we don't have regard for people who sit up nights and have to think about ways to teach us so that we could understand. We should have regard. We should have high regard for the people that God put in our life to help us understand Scripture. As learners, those who are being taught, we should have high regard for the people that God placed in our lives to teach us the scripture. Amen. Look at the patience of the writer of Hebrews. Three times he hint, 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 hint. And then said, I need to explain this to you, but you're slow. I have to take my time. I have to pray and ask God for the wisdom. I stop here. To teach you. You know, teachers have to 